Princely India has been one of the most ignored uh, regions of Indian history. And joining us today to throw light on this very interesting chapter of Indian history is uh, author and historian, Mr. Manu Pillai, who's done some of the pioneering work on the princely state of Travancore. And later his uh, next book was on the Sultans of Deccan. Uh, he's here to talk about his new book, The False Allies, which looks uh, at the different, very interesting uh, characters of princely India and connecting them is a very special person that is Raja Ravi Bharma. Manu, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, pleasure to be here. So Manu, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, uh, on your new book that uh, one thread which binds all these very interesting characters in your book, and they're very diverse characters. There is a, a Divan, a, a South Indian queen, a Rajput feudal prince, but connecting all of them is this great Indian painter, Raja Ravi Varma. So what was the thought process? Like how, how, why did you decide to look at the characters of Ravi Varma's paintings? But you see, there, there are 562 princely states officially. Like that's the list that we offer, or the number that we often hear of. But the thing I realized is that these princely states are extremely diverse. A, a category or a, or a term like princely state makes it sound like there's a standard quality to all of them. But there were huge variations in size, the kinds of rulers that were there, the internal histories and structures of the state. Some states were highly bureaucratized, some were highly feudal, uh, some were ruled over by kings of the robber caste, somebody, some were ruled by Rajput, some were ruled by Marathas. So how on earth do you then pick and choose uh, various princely states and try and understand from a small selection how princely India functions? I thought Ravi Varma was, a, a, at least in my mind, a clever way of going about it because this was a man who came from a princely state in Kerala, in Travancore. He was born there, he was himself descended from Rajas. His sisters-in-law and his granddaughters both became uh, Maharani's of Travancore, you know, in their own uh, times. So in that sense, he was very much an insider. He was somebody who was part of the princely universe. And as a painter, you know, if you track his career, you end up in five states, which I cover in the book, six states, which was Hyderabad, where he, he had a little bit of a, the opposite of success. But he covered a number of princely states in his decades long career starting in Travancore, then Pudukote, then Mysore. So these are the three South Indian states. Then he goes to Baroda and, of course, Udaipur and North India. So he covers like this interesting uh, selection of states. And I thought, well, here I have my way of picking from among the 562 states. Uh, so he was essentially a, a, a conscious thread just to make sure that I got as diverse a set as possible, but also had something running through the book so that, you know, it's not individual essays uh, in, in each chapter but something that has a link to each previous chapter. And there's one element that runs through the book. That's why I thought Ravi Orma would be an interesting way of going about it. So interestingly, the life of life and times of Raja Ravi Varma, the time in which uh, you know he lorded over the Indian art world, uh, was also the time of change in the style of paintings, uh, the you know the printing press, and uh, you know the influence on dramas and movies, and so so in a way he influenced the change. And interestingly, we see parallels in the these princely India where. There was a change from the feudal traditions to this, this way of, you know, with, with the modernity creeping in and these princes standing up for themselves. So if you can yeah. tell us something about that. Well, the thing is, you know, we assume that the Rajas were all sitting about on silk cushions or riding elephants all day long, watching dancing girls all day long. And whenever they felt like they issued arbitrary orders and everybody just fell to their feet and obeyed them and they sort of oppressed all their people. But in reality, if you investigate princely India, you find that these are very dynamic political spaces. A Raja could not get away doing whatever the hell he wanted. He would either be poisoned to death or toppled from, from power. There were politicians within the state. There were factions in court. There were peasant groups. There were tribal groups. And a Raja had to sort of balance all of these elements while at the same time facing off pressure from the British who were sitting on his head. So you essentially have a situation where there's a king who has pressure from above and he has pressures from below. It's not as though he's completely in control of his territory. He's also got to manipulate people there, negotiate politics, do a, a series of things. And I thought, you know, it's important that we speak of this. It's important that we highlight that princely India was not some place where the Rajas were just these caricatures 
you know, lost in the stereotypical world of dancing girls and elephants, but there were interesting, serious things happening. And one of the reasons why a lot of Rajas went to, you know, consciously modernize, consciously bureaucratize their systems, consciously build roads and railways and infrastructure projects, etc., was partly because one of the dandas which the British used to hold over their head was that, oh, you natives don't know how to govern. That's why we are here to essentially teach all you brown people, natives to uh, how, how to govern your own country. Now, obviously, in British ruled India, the British were directly in control. But in princely India, which was 40% of the Indian subcontinent's landmass, they had to obviously turn these rajas into jokes in order to justify their own so-called civilizing presence there. The rajas countered this by trying to ace this whole business of good governance. The whole argument was that you don't know how to govern. So a lot of Rajas would uh, make an effort to prove that not only could they govern, but they could govern on the terms of the British and do it even better, uh, which is why you find there's a lot of overlaps between the kind of people who worked in the princely states as divans or ministers. So if you take a single figure like Sati Madhav Rao, comes to Travancore as a young man, essentially to tutor the princes, comes out of Madras. So he's a Deshastha Maratha Brahmin, Marathi Brahmin, I should say now, but in those days they were called Maratha Brahmins, who comes to, who's from a southern, southern Tanjavur, Kumbakonam area, ends up studying in the British system, comes down to Travancore as tutor to the, to the princes. When the princes grow up, he's a, uh, by then he's appointed minister of Travancore. And this man, within about a decade, he completely turns around the, the face of that, of that princely state. You know, reports are being printed, bureaucratic institutions are being set up, everything is being modernized. And he's bombarding the British from Travancore with data. You know, these many new roads have been built. These many new bridges have been built. These many new schools have been constructed. The result is it reduces the space for the British to interfere in the name of maladministration or misgovernment. After this happens, Madhav Rao leaves Travancore and ends up going to Indore, where he helps the Indore Maharaja do something similar. Finally, he ends up in Baroda, where he helps Baroda sort of transition from a feudal system with a Maratha elite ruling over Gujaratis into, again, a much more bureaucratized, much more centrally managed, uh, efficient, institutionalized form of government. And, you know, that's his three states. One man sort of hops princely states and tries to help them all stand up to these pressures of the British. His classmates, V. Ramayangar, Shesha Shastri, they're doing other things in other princely states as well, like Pudukota, for example. So there was a whole generation at that time for whom the princely states were not somewhat, you know, these backward relics that we should abandon and, and move on. They were legitimate spaces. And it was felt that by proving that you could govern, that Indians under Indian rulers with Indian colleagues and bureaucrats could govern Indian spaces well, they were making a, a counter argument to the British saying that we don't need your guidance. We are capable of managing our country on our own. And the princely states, the successful princely states, are proof of this. So that's why, you know, that, that whole period, we assume that somehow the princely states and the nationalists never got along. But the fact is, for a good 50 years almost, the nationalists and the princes were on the same side. And often nationalists, you know, Dada Bhai Nauruji, we think of him as the man who won the first election to the House, one of the earliest elections to the House of Commons in Britain. But he was also a Divan of Baroda, which we don't uh, talk about enough. And when he came to Baroda, he, he issued this quote, which his biographer Dinyar Patel uh, mentions in his biography, where he says, we have not come to serve the man, that is the king, to serve the cause. What is the cause? It's overlap between princes and nationalists, which was also why a lot of the princes supported the Congress party, gave donations to the Congress party, gave donations to Nauruji's East India Association in London, uh, to the Pune Sarvajanik Sabha, smaller groupings, to colleges, etc. All of these places were cultivating a, a spirit of nationalism. And the Rajas were not meek. They needed this to be cultivated to needle the British from the other side. So they were also responding to the British Empire and imperialism in multiple ways. And that's why the, it's important to study them. Because, you know, as I said, they were, not, they were not caricatures. They were interesting political figures. It's not a question of good or bad, feudal versus modern. It is, the question is, were they political figures or not? And did they do something political or not? And my answer is they did. So, you know, one, you know, talking about stereotypes, one question I wanted to ask you was, considering the last line of your book says that, you know, I mean, hopefully people will start re-looking at the stereotypes we have of the Maharajas. But don't you think since 1990, there has been a lot of uh, reimagining of these Maharajas? If you see Sayajira Baroda, Prime Minister Modi, 
talks about him or, or Chhatrapati Shahu of Kolhapur and his social reforms and you will find his statues everywhere. So there has been a lot of reimagining now, even Nabha and that whole Sikh movement and yeah. also, don't you think there has been a reimagining of the princes in the last 20 years? I think or 20, 20 there's years? a trickle. It's, it, I would say it's a trickle more than a general sense. Even now, you know, when people talk, I begin the book with a quote from Indira Gandhi about where she says, go ask the princes what they did when they ruled, ask them how many wells they built, how many roads they built, and the, the total of their contribution is zero. That is still the kind of prevailing mentality often when you go into political conversations, when people remember the Rajas on a general basis, they think palaces, tourist brochures and hotels now. You know, that's the kind of uh, connection you make. You don't really, very few people in general imagination see the Rajas as interesting political figures who often supported political movements. What you're referring to is a relatively small set of scholars and a small set of voices trying to argue against the cliché. But if you look from the 70s onwards, when James Manor, Robin Jeffrey, Barbara Ramasak, all of them did their first books, down to the present, you can actually count on your fingers the number of books that have been dedicated to princely India. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that's about their lifestyle, there are a lot of memoirs and that kind of glossy stuff which talks about the gossip, the fun and the, the palaces and all that. But very few, I think, even now have taken that serious approach. It is changing, but I would like to make a contribution, I think, through the book, through my book, to at least amending this in the larger conversation around the Rajas. And I've only chosen five. As you said, I've left out Shahu, I've left out Tukoji Rao II of, of Indore, who is a fascinatingly you know, interesting man. He's just a, a quote in the introduction, but I really wish I could have included him. Such a fascinating man. So, such clever ways of uh, attacking the British. Uh, but, you know, some will hopefully from you know, here on, somebody will pick up and there'll be more conversations around this. Uh, that, and the trickle will turn into a proper stream and then, you know, much more mature way of, of looking at the princes.